And for the panel who are here already, let me quickly remind you, there are going to be two buzzers for you. The first buzzer will indicate that you have only five minutes left. The second buzzer will indicate that you have to end the session. And we'd like to finish on time, so we look forward to your support and cooperation as we move forward. All right, an extra alert audience, thank you. But this is session number two that is about to begin. So yes, Ms. Punita Arumagam, Digital Evangelist. Mr. Amok Dusad, Head Content Partnership, Sony, LIV. And our panel moderator will be Mr. Mahesh Narayanan, Digital Evangelist. Can I please have you all on stage? Audience, I know you've had lunch, some more energy, and a big round of applause. We quickly have the mics for the panel on stage, please. Good afternoon, guys. Uh, welcome back after the lunch break. We have the hardest job to keep you awake after a sumptuous meal. Uh, we hope that this conversation will be really engaging. Uh, the ODT panel has been one of the hottest panels um, in, in the session, and uh, we have a whole bunch of exciting conversations planned today. And my co-panelists uh, today, uh, I'd like to go around and probably do a quick round of introductions, uh, maybe, at the, at the top. So good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, so my name is Rahul Mishra, and I head marketing for uh, Shimaru Entertainment. Uh, so a quick background about Shimaru Entertainment. We're a 57-year-old uh, media conglomerate uh, based out of Mumbai. Uh, our main play in content has been Bollywood. We have about 3,500 titles. Uh, we also have a large play in the regional content space, uh, including languages like Gujarati, Marathi, Punjabi, Bhojpuri, Bengali. Uh, what the interesting part about this panel actually is, uh, you know, Shimaru as a company can claim that, uh, you know, back in 1980s, early 1980s, we were the one of the first companies to introduce binge watching. What we hear in OTD right now, uh, people would rent out uh, video cassettes on weekends and uh, you know back watch back-to-back -back movies with families and friends. And uh, life has taken a full circle for us. And here we are today with some of the leading uh, OTD players and content companies. Uh, and uh, to th in the course of discussion, I'll touch upon uh, our OTD play, which is Shimaru Me, and how we are expanding in the regional space in that. You were the original blockbuster of India. <laughs> yeah, in a way, yeah. Amok? Hi, uh, thank you all for having me here. Uh, this is Amok Dusad. I uh, lead content uh, partnerships and new initiatives for Sony Live. Uh, for those who are not aware of uh, Sony Live, Sony Live is the OTT app, the video OTT app uh, from the Sony Pictures Network. Uh, I'm based out of Bombay. Uh, we run tremendous amount of video content on our app. It has a lot of content from our television networks, a lot of live sport programming, uh, gaming, second screen initiatives, uh, to name a few. Uh, the interesting part uh, of uh, being part of this panel is we've also launched uh, Sony Live in uh, Tamil and Telugu language a month back. Uh, we are in the process, in the early stage of uh, striking collaborations, working with some of the content creators out of uh, uh, Chennai and Hyderabad, and looking forward to creating some exclusive digital-only uh, content for these markets. So very excited to be here and very excited to be part of this discussion. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sunil Kamath. I run uh, the business for ShareChat. We are uh, India's uh, homegrown social media network with 60 million users every month who use our platform across 15 languages. And our claim to fame is we don't do English as a language in our app. It's only regional languages that we run on the platform. We are a UGC platform, which means we're a user-generated content platform. Consumers create content using the app or the camera in the app. And that's been a journey which has been very exciting. I'm happy to share a lot of information as we go through this panel. Thank you. Hello all, I am Jacob. I head uh, brand and communication for Penna Cement, one of the fastest cement company, growing cement companies in the country today, with presence across the south and you know, moving into the northern part of the country. Today, 
I'm sure we'll all be able to discuss on the OTT perspective, and we'll have an advertiser perspective as well to be thrown in. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I do not have Shankar's in the audience, but every time I call him up and ask him, how are you? He normally says, Nambore Chennai Lerke, so happy Arke. So I think since we are talking regional and since we are talking OTT, maybe I'll introduce myself in Tamil. Uh, my name is Punita, Empire Punita. Uh, I used to work agency agency Madison agency order Rambanal Velapanne. So all the people in the agency world here, hi. Uh Kapra Anjavarsham Google Levelapanne. So everyone in digital here a uh, big hi. And Ipona uh, I consult with a leading OTT platform, uh, but I'm here as a digital evangelist. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to uh, this panel discussion. So I I'm not talking about any company because uh, I'm just going to talk about digital Thanks, Punita. That one little statement that Punita made, I think, was telling for all of us. Sunil and I were sharing a joke. This is the reason why the, the English platforms will probably never win the regional markets. And I think this is, the, this is the, the big play that he's got as well. What you just did today is what is the play that they've got as a, as a regional language In platform. In fact, we just spoke uh, before we came on stage that language unites consumers. And we get consumers from around the world who download the ShareChat app because they just want to follow content in the local language. And that's a learning in itself, right? Actually, uh, if, <coughs> for whatever I spoke now, if you put subtitles, you would be an OTT platform, so. There you go. Yeah. So just to quickly kind of, uh, and just to be, I'm conscious of time, we, we've got a shortened panel because of time constraints. We didn't, the organizers requested us. Um, so just to give you quick stats, we've now got about 500 million internet, mobile internet users in the country. Um, but I think, most people would agree that in India there is a pre-geo and a post-geo set of data points that we always talk about. Um, some interesting data points. In 2016, we were consuming about 20 crore GB of data and we were paying about 250 rupees per GB. In 2018, we consumed about 370 crores of, uh, 370 crores of GB of data and we were paying about 15 rupees per GB. That's the kind of tectonic shift that's happened today. Uh, and every conversation that we have will be pre-geo and post-geo. Um, I think the one other thing that's, that's happened is the fact that the fall in data tariffs has caused a whole new set of audiences to come in, into the mobile internet world. For, for a lot of them, this is the first exposure to, to the World Wide Web. And estimates are that video will contribute 75% of share of mobile internet by 2021. Uh, from a consumer perspective, it, it's a very interesting play at this point in time. There are 30 plus OTT players today, a whole bunch of them represented here on the stage as well, and a whole bunch of them out there. Um, consumers are spoiled for choice. Uh, at the outset, I wanted to put out the, the kind of three broad models uh, there is a subscription services, which we call SWOD services, subscription video on demand services, where you pay to become a subscriber. There is the advertiser driven services where, uh, and, and where there's premium content only, uh, where it's monetized using advertising. And then there is uh, advertising driven user generated content. Is that a fair estimation? No. Uh, from a consumer perspective, uh, I think consumers are spoiled for choice. Uh, and from a platform perspective, I think there's increased fragmentation. Purita, do you want to talk about the consumer perspective from uh, the kind of choice that's available today and, and the kind of unique insights that we're able to see from the consumption perspective? Got it. Uh, so uh, actually, uh, you know, the ODT space is very, very simple. Uh, if you remove all the jargons that surround the space and the jargons that surround the digital space, uh, OTT consumers consume content exactly like television. So you can ask any OTT platform here and you will figure out the top programs that they consume are exactly the top programs on television. Uh, you look at, for example, uh, you know, the, uh, the repeat viewership that happens, for example, on episode. If someone watched, for example, the first episode of Pandian Stores, then they continue watching Pandian Stores on the OTT platform, right? I mean, so loyalty to episodes and to programs is exactly similar to television. Uh, you look at, for example, uh, 
uh, you, you know, the, the time that they spend, you know, it's exactly the same as television. Uh, so all OTT platforms, in a way, are just a television channel content that's available, for example, in another screen, which is a mobile screen or the computer screen. And essentially what you do is that you're consuming that content exactly the way a consumer consumes television. In fact, uh, one of the leading OTT players like Hotstar, uh, you know, actually go to market uh, with this uh, line that says, much like TV, just smarter. So everything about the OTT platform is very similar to TV. So all of you, you've used television as consumers, as advertisers, as agencies. You just replicate that behavior on an OTT platform. And the only thing you do is that you've got the science of digital that comes into it. And therefore, you just make smarter decisions and, and get smarter ROI by being actually on an OTT platform. One additional point I wanted to add before I pass it on to your move. Um, one startling piece of data was that if Indians spent about two minutes on an average in 2012 uh, on the mobile internet watching videos, at the end of 2019, we'd be spending about 67 minutes uh, a, a day watching mobile internet videos. And that's the global average equivalent. So the kind of consumption change that's happened is pretty significant. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think, you know, Going on with that, you know, we are talking about almost 8 plus GB of data being used by an Indian currently today. You know, we are, you know, much ahead and then even China, which is about say, 5 plus GB today. But this has happened about the problem, the basic thing is the PIP, the person-in-person -person theory. Because, you know, see, somebody is able to devote his own personal liking and as a social person what he wants to see and as an individual what he wants to see at his leisure from right. the appointment viewing to the convenient viewing. So the right. me time is getting consumed specifically for those channels which I personally prefer. So we find even on this particular category. So this, this I'm sure is the mainstay of OTT, probably going forward because of the content. To your point, Netflix global CEO Reed Hastings famously said, we are now competing with sleep. Right? So that's, exactly. that's the kind of consumption habit change that we're seeing today. Mo, you had a point you wanted to make. I, no, I was just uh, on a lighter note. Uh, before this panel started, we had all agreed to disagree with each other. So I just had a small uh, observation on what Punita had said. Uh, so while bulk of uh, content consumption on OTT platforms is catch up of linear television, shows that you miss either on TV or you're not at home at that time, you catch up on them. But very interestingly, uh, one consumer insight that we picked up in some of our consumer work is, uh, and if you reflect upon how you have uh, yourself consumed video, you will realize that TV inherently is a shared experience. Yep. TV always is, uh, is a single TV home, which is bulk of the country, and people's family sort of comes together and watches it. Uh, while the mobile screen sort of offers an individualized and a personalized experience, which, uh, which is, has tremendous uh, implications on the kind of content possibilities that this little consumer behavior change can throw up. Just because I'm watching a piece of content in my own privacy on my own, the kind of content themes, the kind of genres, the kind of storytelling that I can open up uh, suddenly becomes a lot more vast. Uh, so compared to TV and to even to multiplex to some extent where again you don't usually don't go to a movie hall alone, it's a shared experience, you either go with your friends or with your family. I think one unique thing that sort of uh, is uh, relevant for video consumption on mobile is this individual piece. And that's why some of the original content that you are seeing right now coming in, in the local languages or in English or in Hindi or uh, you will start seeing more and more uh, pronouncement of this streak of uh, consumer behavior. We'll see content which is almost unlike TV. The genres that have not been programmed for GB, the insights that you did not see, so shows might get a little more edgier, they might be a lot more uh, out there in terms of the way the treatment is. So, uh, <clears throat> so I think continuing that story of uh, so just some stats, you know, I think regional, uh, we all probably uh, are aware on, on, the, on the digital video space is about 52% uh, of the market size, uh, Hindi being 
So, you know, with the likes of Marathi, uh, followed by Bengali, Telugu, Tamil, uh, these are great, uh, you know, potential markets for any content company. Uh, but I also believe that at the same time, uh, you know, when we have these uh, 200 million people coming on to video streaming platforms in the next three years, uh, there's going to be a requirement for these consumers to get familiar content, content right. they are used to consuming on TV, for them to be able to adopt to the digital ecosystem. Uh, so while edgier content probably works for a for a one percent, two percent, three percent of the uh, of the audience we have in the country, I think majority of the market needs familiar content, uh, and and that's what I think the regional space should look at as well. Uh, that's my viewpoint. Thank you, Duke. You just defended me without me having to pick up the mic. Thank you for that. Yeah. I think it perfectly augurs because all the regional content you know, Seth, probably would have started from the light banter type to probably serious ones. And if you even see most of these stuff which is happening is on the love-hate relationships or probably, you know, the, that kind of a material which still goes on, which has probably changed from the short form to the long form recently. That's, right. That's what is just happening, but people, people would want to, you know, see something which they love. So if I don't like it, I don't see it. Simple, you know. So the content obviously is what would probably pull the person to see that uh, stuff again. I'm going to do a quick fire round so that uh, we can go around different sort of um, thoughts at this point in time. Shemaru, you just recently launched Shemaru Me, which is your own OTT streaming service. Two questions. One, are you going to do on Disney or Netflix and pull out all content from all other platforms and make it available only on Shemaru Me? And two, are you also going to do a caravan and, and launch a bunch of devices uh, and, and merchandise your content on those, on, on those devices? Yeah, uh, okay, that's an interesting question. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, we've been in the ecosystem for, you know, over five decades now. Uh, you know, we've seen various trends, uh, you know, <laughs> happening in the ecosystem from home video to DVDs to, uh, you know, television trends to HD to now OTT. I think one thing uh, we, we're very certain about at Shimaru is uh, we want to reach consumers uh, with our content uh, in, in the best way possible. Uh, so yes, so we will, though we have an OTT play and we are actually going very aggressive with our, uh, with our content bank and uh, you know, the likes of marketing to get users to come and uh, sample content on us, uh, we will still continue holding some of our key partnerships which give us more and more reach. I think the idea is to get our content to more and more people because we, we expertise in certain content genres which uh, most companies don't look at as well, like devotion, for example. Uh, you know, we, we want our content to go to more and more people in the country and internationally. So you guys are like the arms dealers. You will sell to whoever is ready to buy. Uh, yeah, at, at, you know, there, there are obviously costs attached to that. So yeah, so, so we, we, we weigh it down as to you know, where, where we are looking at our growth uh, as compared to immediate uh, revenues coming in. And uh, the second part of the question is obviously, so as I, as I mentioned, we're keen to reach more and more consumers. Uh, though we've launched our OTT Play, we also believe that the mobile screen is a very cluttered medium. You know, one mobile, you're doing multiple things on a given day. Uh, so uh, we also feel that convenience for a customer is very important. So as very recently, we're going to announce our entry into uh, what we call the devices business, which is preloaded content devices. This could be in form of speakers, audiovisual devices where uh, we, we move the consumer away from a mobile screen which, uh, which can be used for watching content but for a pure dedicated experience of content offering them uh, you know specialized uh, speakers or audiovisual devices. Yeah. Amok, would love to hear about the efforts that you're making in terms of content originals and the, from a Sony Live perspective from a regional content audience perspective? Sure. So, uh, let me make an honest admission. I, my journey into creating content for, uh, for Tamil and Telugu started six, eight months back. And uh, I am just fascinated every time I have story narrations planned in Chennai or in Hyderabad. These are the, probably the most exciting hours that I spend as part of my work. Some of the most amazing stories, amazing talent, that we, uh, I get to meet, I hear stories, and because I do the same sort of work even for Hindi uh, back in Bombay, I can sort of see the contrast and see so much potential of new stories. A uh, lot of stuff uh, that, is, uh, that can be very, very exciting has not been exploited or has not come on TV as yet, 
but looks very, very promising. Some of our shows you will start hearing and start seeing our consumer marketing of those shows in a few weeks from now. And we are looking to build a very, very strong lineup. We have struck some collaborations in this market with some of the key makers. We are also looking for fresh talent, writers, uh, directors who really want to voice their, uh, their stories or a story, you know, like they say, everybody has one story in them. And most of our efforts in terms of outreach, even my team uh, based out of Hyderabad and Chennai, scouts out for talent and reaches out to these writers, set up a writer's room so that we can really fish out some great stories, convert them into great products as original series and bring it out on the platform. Sunil. India won the metro, the metros and the, the top tier cities have been the fiefdom of Silicon Valley uh, giants. You are the poster boy of India too. Tell us about the amazing journey that Shaij has had uh, in the last few years. Okay, uh, yeah, I think uh, we started off in 2015 um, when the founders identified a certain trend on existing social media where people were trying to consume regional content, but there was not enough content for them, nor was there a platform for them to interact. So there's this fear of being judged on an English platform is what we realize an emotion that consumers didn't want to really align themselves with, which is when that journey really began and where we are today is, is a story in itself. Uh, we haven't spent hundreds of millions of dollars to acquire those 60 million monthly active users. They have largely been organic on the platform. Uh, and that's, that's like a learning from, from that perspective, right? Uh, just one quick anecdote, we actually had an English ang language option very early days. We found that people chose English to enter the app because it's, it's like you believe, of course I know English, right? It's a bit like cricket. We all believe we know cricket. Yeah. It's a bit like that. But then we, we, we saw very little engagement within the app once they entered. And when we took off the English option and left only the four regional languages we had at that time, that is when people had to make that choice of whether going to go Tamil, Telugu, Malayalam, where we are today, uh, more than 40% of my active users come from the south. Uh, Tamil is like my number one market today. So I'm glad to be here today talking about it. Uh, Telugu is a very close second. Hindi, of course, is a much larger language. But in terms of indexation, obviously, you need to do a lot more. Uh, I think since you're on an OTT regional panel, um, as a social network, what we really do is we, we, we kind of empower creators to create content on our platform okay. through the tools that we have. And those creators are now becoming influencers. Okay. And it is now that we have been approached by brands who are trying to reach out to these tier two, tier three, tier four audiences who are largely SEC, BCD. So if you're trying to sell them something which is gonna be like a long form content, I think what we do is we get them used to short form video content consumption, which is largely 30 to 45 seconds. It's a vertical swipe format platform. So you people don't have a lot of patience to watch content but that's what they typically love doing is watching 25, 30 videos in one session. And that's where we are today. So uh, I spoke about subscription content, uh, advertising driven content, and then user generated content. Big question for you before we go on to the next person. Um, are you gonna do a Snapchat, start producing vertical originals, regional originals? Because that's probably <coughs> the next logical extension. Okay, um, I think where we are today is, uh, our content cost is zero. It will always remain that way. Uh, I don't see, uh, in the short term, I don't see ShareChat investing in creating ShareChat originals. Yeah. We, we made an experiment a year back. Uh, we have certain learnings out of it. But I think there is enough room for us to partner with others who are more keen to reach our audiences and find a more uh, suitable way of integrating that experience in the platform sure. than trying to learn and build on our own. Sure. Uh, the advertiser in the room the most important question, the eyeballs, the consumer eyeballs have moved from television to digital. The shift in ad dollars is more gradual. How soon do you see this shift happening and what are the kind of challenges that you're seeing uh, in making that shift and what, what can we do as platforms to fast track that shift in ad dollars? The convergence of these platforms have certainly generated a lot of interest for an advertiser. I mean, without saying, I'm sure all of us do agree on that. But what would be the value my dollar would get back is a question which you know, we are still not able to answer. Okay, if, for example, on a television or probably a related platform, we have some specific agencies who rates it. Yeah. But probably for this, 
it's only maybe an Alexa or a Comscore or any sort of, you know, which would uh, support your specific lane. Okay, still, you have uh, very niche audiences, so they don't know as a brand, if it's a specific messaging which you want to reach out, yes, there is a possibility. But I think the market is not yet matured for an advertiser to take a specific call to get, for, for example, a construction brand for that matter, to get associated with a specific program or a specific content for that matter. But I'm sure things are changing. Any brand for that matter is willing to probably spend a buck on these platforms now because they see some results, there's a lot of following, at least there's a lot of social changes from the way people would see it. I'm sure this is the way forward, but maybe over a few period of years or probably lesser, you know, I'm sure there could be something which is going to have a measurable thing specifically on this platform so that each of us could take an informed decision. I think this is the way forward. Right. Punita, I was going to ask you, and I, I think you know what I'm going to ask you. You're yeah. probably the person who's got the, the most well-rounded perspective. You've got all the perspectives. You've, what is it that we can do as a group, as a, plat as a group of uh, platforms, to help enable that shift in ad dollars and, 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 and actually keep up in proportion to the kind of shift in consumer consumption that's happening. Uh, first of all, uh, I think ODT is now mass. Uh, I think ODT platforms today claim a reach of 300 million, 350 million, 400 million. And I'm not too sure there are even too many te television channels who can claim that reach. Uh, so first of all, OTTs have arrived and it's time of the OTTs now to get used in plans. That's the first thing. The second thing is that, uh, uh, you know, by the power of it being digital, it is measured. Uh, because if you look at it, any digital plan uh, will give you clicks, you know, will give you reach, will give you frequency, will give you impressions, and all of it are third-party measurements uh, that actually come. So the fact of it is that measurement already exists in digital. Should OTT be measured like television? I genuinely do not know if that's the right answer because we are going backwards rather than forward then. You know, that's the second thing. The third thing is uh, that a uh, lot of brands today, uh, you know, uh, in their minds have started, for example, and I remember when I was working in Godridge, on Godridge in Madison, they used to do this, where they used to keep aside 20% of their monies, you know, of the over, overall budgets for trying out new things to see that if it works. And then if it works, they start actually migrating monies then to the medium that actually works. Uh, so that would be the third thing that you would do, which is, uh, to, uh, to start trying because there is never, you're never going to get success stories from the world around you if you don't create those success story yourself. And the fourth thing is that today, I think if you do not do it fast, you have actually lost the momentum and the opportunity that you actually have. Uh, so uh, those would be the points I would say where OTTs have scale. Uh, I mean, I do not know how big a scale you require to start using them. ODT by being digital are already being measured. Uh, and uh, start experimenting, you will know if it works, and don't wait for someone to create that success story, create it yourself. It's yeah. a great way to summarize the session. Thank you so much, Punita. Thank you so much, all the co-panelists. I know we are short of time. Do we have time for questions? Or? Thank you. Thank you so much for keeping up time, and yes, regional content is gold. Thank you. Once again, a big round of applause for this fantastic panel, ladies and gentlemen. I take this opportunity to invite Mr. Anand Sankeshwar, Managing Director of Digvijay News, and Mr. Palni from Media95 to join us on stage and felicitate our panel and moderator. Can I have you on stage?
Our next session will be on the role of audit agencies, and it's going to begin right away. All right, uh, thank you very much. And also, panel, we'd like a quick group photo holding your mementos. Thank you, thank you so much, gentlemen, for honoring our panelists and moderator. Can I have a quick group photo, all of you? No, just the panel and the moderator alone. Yes, with your mementos in hand, a quick group photo, if you don't mind. Quickly. All right, our role of audit agencies is our next session. I take this opportunity to invite Mr. Chandrasekhar Mantha, partner Deloitte India, Mr. Chaitanya, head marketing and communications, SRM University, Mr. Madhavan P, executive vice president, TVS Tires, Mr. Karan Taurani, vice president, media and consumer discre discretionary, Elara Capital, and moderated by Mr. Moha Joshi, managing director, Havas Media. Can I have you all on stage? Ladies and gentlemen, a nice big round of applause for this panel and team. The role of audit agencies. Over to you, gentlemen. Good afternoon, everybody. Is there some energy in the room or not? After uh, lunch, normally the energy repletes. So. Well, the uh, session that we are going to be talking about is going to be a very interesting and a very, I would say, uh, sensitive uh, topic as well, uh, audit. So audit is never seen uh, as, a, as a very positive thing, whether it is by the agencies or by the clients. And uh, I have with me an esteemed panel over here representing a, uh, the clients. And in fact, uh, Mr. Madhavan is my client in actual life, so you know, it's even, even more realistic from that perspective. And we have the audit agencies also represented here. Now, let me, before we start, let me just take you back in time. You know, if we were to rewind the time machine and those people who started their careers in the 90s would remember that uh, uh, when the advertising agencies used to work with clients, uh, there was no audit as a concept, right? There was a 15% that the agencies charged, which was very happily given by all the clients. And it was never asked. There was no questions uh, uh, that were discussed around it. It was only with time when the dis disintegration happened, the agencies became media agency, creative agency, PR agency, uh, out of home agency. And then the complications of media, uh, uh, I would say, fragmentation, and also somewhere the break of trust that happened between the agency partners and the clients that the role of audit agencies as third partners came in. So with this, I will first uh, request Ms. Madhavan to the first question that I have for all of you is that what do you think made audit so important? What, what has made audit so important in today's day and age? What is it that triggered the importance of audit in this uh, environment? There, were, there was no media audit before 1995, 96, I would say. Mr. Madhavan. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, thanks, Mohit. Name is Madhavan. I work with TVS Tires. I take care of sales and marketing for them. Uh, pretty sensitive and partly controversial also. And I, over the next five, ten minutes, I'm hoping that I'll finish a review of uh, our agency also, planning and buying agency. Uh, that's on the lighter side. Um, can't the agency deliver this at a fixed margin? Of course, yes. I do not agree with the uh, line that uh, you said on. Uh, trust deficit. No, there isn't any trust deficit. I, you'll have to understand where I'm coming from. For example, as an advertiser, is cost pressure. We are always running against time. We are absolutely not sure how much to put in and what will uh, what will be the return for the money that we put in. The bang for the buck is something which is uh, not visible at the start. See, just to be doubly sure, we have to go to someone else to check if are we doing the right thing. It's not just about the agency, it is also about our own uh, uh, decision making abilities there. So therefore, that's the part disagreement. But do we need the uh, audit agencies? Jury still out, but I personally think that probably we need them at this point in time. For the same reason that I said, are we, uh, are we spending right? Are we getting the right returns? 
there is no transparency. Look, look at it, um, if I can take another uh, 45 to 60 seconds, I look at it uh, on the sales side, and this is on the marketing side. Sales side, a lot of these companies which used to do uh, tendering, prices where you know ballpark what would be the price, you, you, it was all prefixed and so on, and everybody had their margins. Now today, the uh, pressure that uh, has, the system has changed, the pressure led to a change in the system. Reverse auctions tell you exactly what the customer wants to pay, and more importantly, what the uh, uh, vendor can deliver at that price. I'm not saying that this will uh, come here at some stage uh, where uh, there could be uh, agencies pitching at a particular volume for, uh, at particular GRPs and at a particular cost. Never know if that can happen here, but till that time, till that time the industry matures, the transparency comes into play, we're gonna have this uh, media audit agencies there in place. Thank you. Thank you so much, thank you so much. Uh, uh, now I'll request Chandrasekhar, you know, you represent uh, the, the audit side of the, uh, side of the business, so uh, wh why do you think this whole uh, situation is as it is today? And what, what, what are the factors that have been responsible for it to bring it to this situation? So, uh, thanks Mohit. Uh, just to introduce myself, uh, Chandrasekhar Mantha, I'm a partner with Deloitte uh, within Risk Advisory. I lead the media and entertainment sector for uh, Risk Advisory. And this happens to be one of our solutions that we offer to our uh, clients. Uh, just to take it from what Mr. Madhavan mentioned, that uh, the value at risk here is pretty high. So the advertisers want uh, a lot of value for the money that they're spending on these advertisements. Uh, and there is a fiduciary relationship between the advertisers and the agencies. Now, uh, uh, does, is there a trust issue? No, even I believe that there is no trust issue. But does it require a second line of and a third line of defense? Yes. Because I think uh, what an independent eye brings to the table is that uh, it brings the third line of defense or the second line of defense as we call uh, in our world. Um, wherein there is, an, there is an oversight or there is a, there is a maker checker kind of a concept uh, on, on these spends. Uh, now, the, the role of an auditor or I, I hate to be called myself as an auditor, by the way, I would love myself to be called as an advisor. So in our world, we typically call it as media spends advisory rather than saying media audits. Uh, so when I'm, when, I'm, when I'm talking about advisory or when I'm talking about reviews on audits, I'm, the role of a media auditor or media review has changed over a period of time. Where it started from pure pre compliance to rate benchmarkings to, you know, uh, this thing. now it's more on helping the client decide. Now it's more on partnering with the agency and the client to take them to the best, to, to the best path. And I think I don't see my, ourselves as on a different side with the agencies. We are pretty much on the same side and we are jo jointly working towards a common objective of getting our clients a value. I think that's where, that's what my, my take on the whole audit side is. Great, I'm so happy, you know, being on the agency side, uh, two of my partners are saying that, you know, there is no trust issue, which is a very good thing and that's how it should be. Now I'll, uh, I'll come to uh, Chaitanya and, you know, you, uh, he also represents the, the client side of the business and uh, about his views on how he sees audit and what has so been I'll, his experience. I'll, I'll start with saying that two-thirds of the earth is covered with uh, water and one-third is with auditors. Whatever my colleague, panelist Deloitte says that they are working together for the development of the client, but why is that auditor is paid more than an agency? I love it. <laughs> it doesn't make sense. So I'll tell you how it uh, all arrived at. So initial stages in 90s when uh, the media was in booming stage, uh, it all, uh, uh, clients had that apprehension whether uh, the media will work out or not, whether you will be able to make that kind of uh, no spends and uh, return of investment on and suddenly media started delivering and all the media big companies the so called companies who are very small became very big then they started increasing the budgets i come from a client agency background and then became a client so i understand the pain of the both sides so then what you do is as a as a brand head you go and ask more budgets with the management and the one started budgets started flowing the the so called cfos of the organization they start seeing that, oh, oh, these people are every year increasing the budgets, but actually brand can grow without advertising. 
So that's where they will feel that, okay, uh, the so-called one-third auditors keep approaching the management saying that we can give a better value to you. So they come to you and talk to you the same language which you have been talking for last 10 years. And, and they will like to tell you, I'll be very crude, please. Uh, 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 that's the reality what uh, I felt is my, my own personal opinion. With all the experience that we worked with a couple of uh, the so-called multi-billion dollar uh, um, auditing firms. So when they came and approach and tell you the, uh, the annual uh, budgets that we present and the kind of uh, media agencies work hard and uh, every day, night and try to give you the, all the numbers, try to understand clients are smart. They are not only talking with the agency and not talking with the uh, channel partners or digital partners. Every client would love to talk to the, you know, directly with the agency and there is a greater transparency that has evolved as better than any other uh, place that can ever happen in this media market. So I, I have a different views on entire uh, auditing firms, auditing media especially, and uh, auditing on uh, strategy, auditing other things, strategies depends on individual talents to uh, prove about their way of telling to the client. But on especially on media, on rates, I feel that uh, uh, eventually, after one some point of day, the management will come to know that uh, everything is on white paper and everything will go smoothly and then it keeps uh, rotating around between the internal uh, marketing team and the uh, agency because the, they both are going to be the real uh, uh, no, front runners to make the business run. Thank you so much uh, and thanks for the controversial and uh, you know, counter views which is important. Uh, Karan, I, I'll request you to give me your point of view on, uh, on the question. So yeah, just to introduce myself, uh, I am Karan Torani. Uh, I work with Ilara Capital and I'm in charge of the media entertainment uh, research here. So generally just want to share my view on this entire uh, auditing part. Uh, I think it's very much necessary f to have all three parties into conference so that there's no biasnesses. So basically the advertiser, the agency and the audit firm should work all basically hand in hand. And uh, I think audit definitely is necessary to, you know, eliminate the subjectivity quotient uh, from an agency to invest in a particular medium. And uh, it is an effective uh, way of measuring ROI. And specifically in today's time, I think it's a very, it's a much needed kind of an approach because of digital. So digital advertising in today's time, as you know, is more uh, bot based. You know, the clicks can be bought out. It's AI based. A lot of technology is, you know, going on to that. So I think audit becomes more necessary in today's time where digital advertising are picking up in a very, very big way. Uh, I I think every advertiser who would want to go in terms of digital advertising will definitely go for an audit agency to basically get some more extra effort and extra work to be done on that to measure the ROI part. Thank you so much. So interesting point of views came in, you know, the fact that trust has not gone uh, out but it is the cost pressures. It's, it's also about the fact that a lot of value is at risk and which is a very fair point that you, that you made. At the same time, uh, you know, the rate audit is not something which is most desirable and I tend to agree with you on that How particular point. How an audit company knows what is the correct rate? Give me one right reason, today what star sells? How will he know that whatever he's selling ERP and star Vijay, which is in there here, what is they're selling at prime time is the right rate? Which an agency will is the right person to tell you what is the time rate that uh, GRP that is, what is the CRP that is there? What is the tool, any of these audit companies which have the CPRP, or a ER uh, effective rate which as an audit company can come without client's help. I'll tell you what happens. We get a mail, okay, from an auditing company and there is a beautiful girl who speaks to us, hey Chetanya, how are you doing? I am from the so-and-so company. I want to come and sit with you and discuss about the plans that you worked on the last year. Could you please share me the last year plan? Okay, I go back and just search all my emails and try to give their RPMs. They sit on my own plan, okay. Works reverse tendering what Mr. My, you know, Madhavan has told me, saying that, oh, Chaitanya has for freeze the rate at 2,300 year, it can be actually closed at 200. So in the same next year, the budget measuring plan, when you present the same plan, last year we have not increased the rates for Star, or Hindu, or Times of India, they have been rushing around to me and saying that we have grown our numbers, we have been doing so good, so please increase my, by 10%, the you know, inflation rate has become so well, but as a client, I will not be able to increase it, but then audit comes and says, last year itself you played so much, Chaitanya, how can you play it for so well? So I wanted to understand in this panel how an auditing firm can tell me that this is the perfect rate on this channel or at this CRP, how, what is the tool without having the base of what client has, they can tell me, then is, what is my point here? So 
you're, you're taking the thunder away from me. <laughs> and, a you know, very valid point. Would you want to uh, respond to that? Yes. I'll try and address that. Uh, see, I, I get your point on that you are in a better position to kind of understand the rates uh, in, because you've been dealing with the client, uh, you know, day-to-day -day basis. You, you are in touch with the pulse of the media and you understand the rates. Having said that, I think it's fair to also recognize the fact that the auditor on the other side may also have equal amount of experience, knowledge, as well as, uh, you, know, uh, you know, the wherewithal to understand what is working in the market currently. Now, um, over a period of time, and I think most of the audit uh, agencies or, as I say, advisory agencies in this space uh, have been in the play for more than 15 years or so, right? So over a period of time, we've had clients uh, who've seen value. And if uh, over a period of time we've, we've generated value for them, over a period of time they've seen some savings out of this, I think there is some merit in the way an independent eye sees uh, the way things are being operated. So I think, uh, in my view, yes, I agree that agencies have the right capabilities to uh, get the rates right. But at the same time, uh, 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 an auditor comes up with a very independent and an objective uh, approach uh, with, with also probably uh, equal uh, skill set. and and can add value to this process. I think that's, that's where I see in, in most of the clients that I have worked or where we have worked, uh, I think we have been able to add that, that value to the clients. I'm not going to take sides, but uh, uh, <laughs> I, I'm not exactly in support of the audit agencies, but let, one thing we need to keep in mind, they are working with multiple clients. They know how the other clients have used, how the other clients have paid, which as a buyer, I, which as as a as a uh, advertiser i have i'm not privy to that data what the audit agency knows uh, once he comes and tells me that look we've analyzed and this is what the price in the market generally is then i know that look i'm if i'm charged that same price i know that look i'm paying the right money otherwise it's absolutely i mean i'm i'm blind and stone blind there so for i said still the time we get transparency there if there is a syndicated report which publishes what could be the right price, then probably audit agencies will vanish or they will morph to be the syndicated uh, uh, reporting agency, so to speak. So I'll come to another uh, slightly controversial question, you know, and whoever wants to respond, please respond. At times, uh, I mean, I, I represent a media agency and uh, sometimes my clients, not you, but sometimes some of my clients say that, you know, I've, I've, uh, I've uh, hired this auditing agency and uh, they are giving me A, B, C, D, E information. And uh, I tell them, okay, but I could have also given you the same information. And I would not even have charged you because that probably would have been a part and parcel of my regular, uh, uh, you know, offering to you. But I'm sure you're giving a very, very big uh, uh, sum of money to those guys to give you that data and obviously layer that with their own learning, which I'm not questioning at all but then the question is that delta that you are giving whether that delta ratifies the delta learning that you are getting from them or not so again a very controversial question would you want to have a uh, point of view on this i've been not able to understand one simple logic of how will agencies will have less clients and auditing firms will have more clients in media industry. It's impossible. The only the so-called big people who has big budgets are the one who will be able to appoint an auditing company. But whereas agency will have top to down bottom companies, their rate efficiencies among all the clients will be far, far better than what an auditing firm company comes and tells you. So in whatever, that's one part ahead. So what an auditing firm company can come and give you the visible points is on a theoretical manner. I'll be very open because I worked very closely with last three and a half years with some of the big uh, auditing firms on some of the half a billion dollar project. So when they come and tell you more theoretical point of view on the uh, media perspective, whether it is digital or whether it is digital, because you need to try to understand the bigger agencies have invested so much of money on the softwares, so much of data they have, the, so much of day-to-day -day understanding the kind of things which they are overloaded with the knowledge which the client is having today right now. So I still believe whatever whoever client is telling, 
the agency is taking, uh, the, those guys who are able to tell you that data and you are not able to give me that data, there is a communication gap between the uh, agency and the client. But usually, it, uh, the businesses who depends only on media to get every year spikes of their businesses, whether it is sales or application forms or whatever it is, there's a greater relationship and a greater understanding. And actually, they go one mile up, down, and go into the market and do a free survey for you, and then they come back for you. So I think uh, we are narrowing down the d discussion to a very small area of the overall media uh, spend advisory, if I may call. We are only focusing on the rate part of it, whereas if uh, in the world that we are currently and the discussions that we are having with our clients, the, the areas that we are helping them or um, you know, giving them advice on has expanded beyond rates. We are setting up dashboards for them, we are setting up uh, you know, technology platforms for them to be able to monitor these spends on a much more rigorous and a regular manner. I think the conversation has moved much larger beyond whether I'm buying at the right rate or not. I think the conversation is also uh, about the processes that I have in place to ensure that my, I am delivering on the value commitments that I've made to the client. Uh, the, 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 the focus is also on the client side of the processes. Uh, the focus is also on detecting ad frauds, which is again a very upcoming topic. Uh, so I think the, the scope of media audits, as we call, uh, is, has, has widened much beyond the rate conversation that we are having. And I think that's, what, that's where the value part of it comes from. So I think one needs to look at it much more broader. I think I Ironi think. said the point about the, uh, you know, the how ad fraud part is the next big thing right now. I think it's more of analytical framework being added from the audit side than just the agency just looking for the rates and you know, that kind of thing. I think we've moved much ahead of just the rate part, as you rightly said. So analysis is something which an audit firm would do more effectively than an agency. And I think that's where we basically add the value. I think this is a topic that cannot be discussed in 30 minutes because, you know, there are, there are many elements to it and I'm really thankful to everybody for uh, having come and uh, shared their uh, honest opinions uh, with us. And with this, I hand it over to the MC, please. Thank you so much. Now, that was some panel, really. I mean, it felt like it was, I was watching a news discussion. Shaitanya, you did an Arnab, you know that. A big round of applause for this interesting panel. Can I invite Mr. Srinivasan, Editor-in-Chief, TheFederal.com, and Mr. Nanda Kumar, VP Sales Radio City, to join us on stage to felicitate our panel and moderator. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, a nice big round of applause for the team on stage. We're also going to be doing the Hindu quiz. So for the audience, here's a question that's coming your way and it involves the Tiruvalluvar statue. So be ready. A goodie bag from the Hindu awaits you. And right after this, a quick group photo of the team on stage. So yes, audience, meanwhile, let me ask you this question. The famous Tiruvalluvar statue and it stands at 133 feet. Can you tell me where is it located? If you know the answer, be ready. We're getting a goodie bag from the Hindu. I saw you first. I will come to you, sir. Don't hit him, ma'am. I know. You saw that. Thank you very much. Yes, he says he knows the answer. Gentleman right there, just put his hand up. Kanyakumari. That is the right answer. Give him a nice big round of applause and a goodie bag coming your way from the Hindu for you. And our next session, I hope you guys are ready for brand and brain mapping. For this, I invite on stage Mr. M.A. Parthasardi, CEO, Mindshare India, 
Ms. Momita Goshal, India Lead Nielsen Consumer Neuroscience. Can I have you two on stage? As the panel is getting ready, we have a federal gift hamper. Just tell me which is the coffee capital of India. Put your hand up if you know the coffee capital of India. Yes, hands up. It's right here in South India. The gentleman there knows. Can we quickly take the mic? Panel, thank you for being patient. In a moment, your session will begin. Right there. there. And it's a gift from the federal. Is it Chennai? We drink a lot of coffee, yes. We are powered by coffee. Who's that? The lady, right there, absolutely right. Women are always right. Ladies and gentlemen, a big round of applause. A gift coming your way from the federal. All right. Uh, thank you so much and congratulations. Uh, panel, you may continue. Thank you very much. Thank you for your patience. Hello. Uh, from audit to brain mapping, I think it's two uh, extreme ends of the advertising spectrum, right? I mean, one is all about uh, numbers and, you know, adding up the totals and the other one sounds really almost, uh, you know, vague and sci-fi in, uh, in its orientation. Uh, I'm with a media agency, I work with Mindshare and Momita, you want to tell them what you do for a living? Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, thanks for having me here. So my name is Momita and uh, I lead the consumer neuroscience practice for South Asia for Nielsen. So that's what I do for a living. <laughs> I'll get into details in a bit, I think, yeah. Yeah. So, so when the first, uh, when Shankar gave us this topic, and I think he was deliberately teasing us by giving us a topic like this, but. But we said, let's, let's uh, look a little beyond. Let's, let's take a step back. And I think what's happened is in the last, uh, say, four to five years, the way technology has evolved in the field of marketing is really fascinating. You know, we are doing things today which, uh, you know, weren't even thought about potentially five years ago. So I thought what we would use the next 15 minutes is very quickly to touch upon some of the areas where technology has impacted marketing. Uh, and uh, we'll broadly cluster it into three buckets, right? The first is, has technology changed the way we understand our consumers in marketing? And I think that's definitely true. The second is, having understood those, com those consumers, is there a way to really know what gets them excited when it comes to a piece of marketing stimulus, uh, whether it's an ad, whether it's a video, whether it's anything which you see? And then finally, has technology changed the way we measure all of this, get the insights, and then plow it back into the entire process from the beginning all over again? So, so I think that's what, that's what we'll uh, talk about. Any opening thoughts from your side on this, Momita? Yeah, I think, I think uh, uh, the way you put it, uh, MAPS, is really uh, the way to look at it. Uh, technology today has enabled us to remove a lot of biases, which which come with traditional, uh, you know, ways of asking questions and, uh, you know, doing research or even, you know, basing a lot of our targeting decisions on claimed data. So that's the biggest change that I see uh, has happened over these years. And as you rightly pointed out, uh, over the last few years, uh, things that have changed, of course, we spoke a lot about AI, big data, uh, all through uh, the morning, but also a lot of... Uh, uh, I would say advancement in terms of brain measurement. So this is something that we've been, I think, talking for, you know, many years now. But over the last few years, the way things have become scalable in this field and how we can easily now really read reactions of a consumer's brain to marketing stimulus has changed the way we do research today. So. Uh, just to kind of continue on that, so far we've always relied on asking questions and getting answers and taking our decisions basis that. Now, we lose a lot in that because when a consumer um, answers and articulates, he misses out on a lot because the memory doesn't serve him. He cannot articulate a lot of things because a lot of things are felt and not thought through. So when you ask somebody showing a pack 
or showing an ad. What did you like about it? It's difficult for the person to really articulate. There are lots of biases also that come in. There are articulation biases, there are rationality biases, there is recency bias, whatever I have seen very recently, I tend to remember that. Over the course of time, I'll forget. And there are a few other biases as well. But uh, that is not how they process this creative. They, when they process, they process it in real time. If in real time it, it kind of touches a chord, then you act upon it. If it doesn't, you forget about it. I mean, no matter how much we want, but ads and brands are not such a critical part of the human psyche, as marketers feel, right? So it becomes all the more critical in this age of clutter to touch them in the right way. And if they are reacting mostly through system one, which is not the thought through system, it's really the spontaneous system. That's how we take most of our day-to-day -day decisions. Most of our day-to-day -day activities, we, we actually run on system one then it becomes absolutely important to really understand the system one response. This was a thought for many years, but was not, we weren't able to do it in a, in a good enough manner because we didn't have the technology. Now we do. So the great thing now is that we can use uh, what we call EEG or electroencephalograph, something like an ECG for the brain. But what we can do now is we can really read the brain's response to stimulus that they see. It's not a thought reader, so we cannot understand what you're thinking, but we can definitely understand how you're reacting in terms of emotional connect, in terms of memory circuits getting activated, long-term memory circuits, and the attention you're paying. Now, if you know an interplay of this, you're very well able to really predict how that stimulus is likely to perform in real life. So that's what. Fascinating. Who would have thought uh, electroencephalography will be used to decide whether a consumer likes an ad or not, right? But, but I, think, I think the key point she made is claimed behavior versus actual behavior. Now, I know, I'm sure all of you would have been a, in a focus group at some point of time, right? The first guy who says, I read The Economist, after, after that, everyone will become an expert on reading The Economist. You know, no one will come back after that and say, you know, I read Daily Mirror. They will have to say, I read The Economist, just to sound intelligent in that group. So what we are seeing today is, it's not that traditional forms of research are going away. In fact, if anything, there is a need because that really is required to get into some of the deep-seated values, beliefs, and so on. But what's critical is to have a way to also merge that with behavioral data. So today, in, in, uh, in the way we do our work, for instance, I might say I have, say, 150 million profiles of whom I know 40 to 50 things. Does the guy like golf? Does he like cricket? Does he like, uh, you know, uh, gardening? Does he, does he go to wildlife sanctuaries? And I get that data basis, a whole host of how he behaves in the online ecosystem. And when I merge that data with, you know, what, he, what his deep-seated needs, values, beliefs are, you get a much rounded profile of the person. And then you make creative or your content to suit that person, right? But then the beauty comes with the technology she spoke about. I have understood this guy, I've made this piece of communication. But which part of that communication actually triggered that neuron or that sensation, you know, in a 30-second in a piece? Did he really get excited at section 15 or at second 22, you know? And therefore, what do I need to tweak and what do I not tweak? And then kind of come back and probably serve that same communication to consumer A or consumer B or consumer C and find out who reacted to it even better in the real world. I mean, to whom did it move the needle in terms of awareness, in terms of actually going and perhaps making a sale? And then you plow that entire learning back. And I think that's where this whole thing of brain mapping, if we can call it that, and the way brands behave and uh, consumers react to brands, I think is coming... Uh, full circle in the world. There, there's also this thing about brands themselves. They sit in the brain as a network of associations, right? So when you create an ad or any sort of marketing stimulus, you don't always end up activating only the associations for your brand. And that is why there is misattribution. You make your brand, you make insertions of the brand at various points in your ad. We see lots of ads these days which are like long duration ads, which are great story which engage you, but at the end, they do not do much for the brand. 
And that's because, you know, how well is it integrated into the storyline? Even when does it make an entry? You know, how, uh, how does it make an entry? A lot of times you have brands placed in the frame, but people are not really looking at it. People are looking at the model and getting engaged, but not at the brand, right? So even that bit about how well your stimulus is activating your brand, is it standing for your brand? Is it standing for someone else? What is the essence of your brand? A lot of these deep-seated thoughts, they complete the picture, honestly. Like what Maps you were saying, it's not that traditional research is redundant. I won't say that. But that was one part of the picture, and we were not going beyond that. Without this, without uh, the brand making a connect at a subconscious, the rationalization does, doesn't even kick in. Yep. Because the first step is the subconscious aha. So one, un, un, unless that aha happens, rationalization won't happen. And that's the feedback that was missing and now I think it gets added to the picture. Absolutely. I mean, just to kind of wrap it up because I know we are running behind time on, uh, and so I'll wrap it up. But, but I think when she spoke about every brand being a network of neuron connections in a human brain, it's a very interesting concept. I mean, it's not, a, it's not a tagline, it's not a, but it's a sum total of everything you think about of the brand. I think that's why more and more marketers are saying, let's not do brand messaging, but let's create brand experiences. Because I might have the most beautiful ad, but if my app doesn't download in 3.2 seconds, then my experience is gone for a toss. So the, the neural network of how you recognize brands is actually a sum total of all of this. That's and, right. and uh, you know, that's what makes it uh, so fascinating and therefore every single touch point if we can measure what is the deep-seated kind of emotion that particular brand engagement or interaction does, then you know, you're really, really mapping the consumer's brain. And I think if you can do that from start to finish, from how you said targeting the consumer in the right way, and then, so it's half and half, right? Targeting is one half of the story and getting the right creative is absolutely the other half. So once you get both of these right and yeah. remove biases using the technology available today, I think we'll have a winning story there. Correct. Yeah. So, so from paise ki baat to man ki baat, as, we, as, our, as the famous saying goes. And thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. I never thought I'll hear neuroscience as man ki baat. Nice perspective right there. So I'm going to take this opportunity to invite Mr. Arunishwar, CEO Udayam Dhotis, to please join us on stage and felicitate our panel. Ms. Momita. Group photo, please. We won't leave you without photos. 